everybody doing today? Good? Good. Glad to hear. So I'm going to talk about management of UX uh, projects in a second. Um, I have to preface my presentation by telling you a couple of things. Number one, uh, I'm really glad to be mic'd up because I can't speak any louder than this. I'm just recovering from strep throat, so <laughs> I'm not contagious, my doctor told me. So uh, I apologize if uh, I can't raise my voice more than this. If you're having any trouble hearing me in the back, there's plenty of seats right up front. Okay, Ron? Yeah, over the celery. So um, the thing about managing UX projects is that projects are kind of different uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Teams are different. Organizations are different. So this is my uh, approach, and I am going to talk uh, specifically about how we do things at UITV. Like Audrey said, um, I was at Kendi for about 10 years uh, doing uh, consulting in UX, and that's a very project intensive type of work. So there we would do about 40 projects a year on average. Uh, so I have about 400 different projects under my belt uh, as a consultant. Uh, I was consulting for about 20 years. Uh, prior to that, a bit of product work, so now I'm back in the product space discuss any differences between product environment versus consulting environment. But for now, I'm going to focus on, uh, on what we do in UITV. So I'll tell you a little bit about the company and what we do, because that gives a little bit of context about the projects that we undertake and how we manage them. Uh, also going to talk about the team that I have there and how that impacts the projects and how we plan for them, uh, a look at a typical project, and then talk about the collaborative process, the workflow, and then finally the culture. All of those things have an impact on how projects are managed. In terms of the format, are, are we accepting questions during the presentation? However you want it to be. Want? Okay, so if you have any questions, I think we have a, a, a Q&A after, of course. But if there's anything that pops up, just feel free to ask questions, okay? So has anyone ever heard of UITV, show of hands? <laughs> Some of you, yes. Um, for those of you who haven't, we make uh, cross-platform video apps. So think about Netflix, right? So you watch Netflix on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, on your Xbox or your PlayStation or on the apps on your smart TV. Um, we build similar apps to Netflix for different clients that are cross-platform. Our value proposition, however, is that we do it from a single code base. So in the past, if you had 10 different devices that you were building apps for, you would have 10 different development teams developing for each of those devices. Now, with our product, you can have one development team single code base, developing a single code base, run it through our UI engine, and that propagates to as many devices as you want. So our role as a UX team at UITV is to create that front end for all of those different devices that adhere to the platform conventions, that adheres to the best practices and the heuristics for good design for television, for example, for tablets, for computers, uh, for phones, etc., so that it is a good uh, user experience for each device, as opposed to just taking one type of interface and trying to shoebox it into uh, many different form factors. So that's what we do. We reach our customers where where they are. So we're developing for Windows. We're developing for Samsung TVs, LG TVs like this one, um, Xbox, Android, iOS. One of our main tools that we use is After Effects. Our design team is a little bit different. I'll get into that uh, on the next couple of slides. But part of the reason that, uh, that we rely so heavily on After Effects is that uh, the motion design is a very big part of our overall user experience design. So what does a team look like at UI? 
before, I'll, I'll strictly speak for, from the UX point of view, simply because every team, every team is different. So this is my team. Um, some of them are in the Zara is here, Jimmy is here. Uh, so uh, Jimmy and Zara are Clue students. Uh, the rest are employees. Uh, there is about 27, there are about 27, maybe 25 or so there, uh, people that report into the UX director at UITV, and um, they fall under three, well, four distinct categories. We have our UX uh, researchers, and they are a dotted line to me because they actually work for the product organization, and everybody here works for our services organization. What that means is we build, we build products for clients. These folks work on our SDK. So these guys do the UX research and design for our own software. And these guys, they build software for paying clients using our SDK. So we have a really interesting dynamic where these guys are actually clients for these guys. So they use what these guys build. So we have three, in addition to research, we have three distinct design disciplines. We have interaction design, of course, visual design, and motion design. One of my colleagues, um, he had a really interesting way of describing it. Not being from the UX field, uh, had a little bit of trouble wrapping his head around what we could do. And so one of our folks described it to him like this. They draw the box, they color the box, they make the box move. Right? So that's. I couldn't have thought of a more simple way of describing what we do. But it's not as simple as just drawing the box and coloring the box, right? So our interaction designers are also the researchers on our team. They are the ones who understand the user requirements. They understand the business case. They work with the VAs and the clients to understand why certain features are necessary in the product. These are the ones at the early stages find the experience. The visual designers and the motion designers build and iterate on that experience. They refine that experience. But this is where it starts. <coughs> they validate their concepts through very traditional UX methods. So we're wireframing. We're doing usability walkthroughs. We're doing iterations uh, based on our research. So in terms of deliverables, we're making personas. Uh, we're looking at the content metadata overview. And content and metadata, when you're designing for television, is actually really, really important. Um, information architecture, when you're designing for television, is really, really important. Think about Netflix, right? How many people here have a Netflix account? Show of hands. All right. I won't ask if it's actually your account. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think about those swim lanes in your Netflix interface and how they're labeled, right? I remember one time scrolling through Netflix and I said they had a swim lane, um, action movies with strong female leads. Right? So they have, they have a really interesting algorithm for how their content is organized and categorized. We have to really work at reflecting the mental models of the users. So the content, the metadata is interesting for us because a lot of that is exposed at the presentation layer. Whereas when you're designing for the web, if you're designing applications or kiosks or apps, you don't necessarily expose a lot of your metadata. But for us, the content metadata, things like the year it was produced, actors, directors, etc., that's kind of the kind of stuff that we actually expose at the presentation layer. So it's not only the content, but a lot of the metadata also has to be considered when we're designing. We build prototypes, we design the app flows, we do user testing, and capture a lot of that in our documentation. The visual designers on our team, um, they are absolute rock stars. That whole team is filled with rock stars. The visual designers actually have a tough job because they have to translate brand. So they are looking at, um, we'll go through some of our clients later, um, but they're looking at all of these different clients that we have they are sh trying to apply those client brands to the designs of the interaction project in a project-based environment uh, where time frames are really important. This is the, the more 
quickly iterate, the uh, better you're going to respond to any kind of changes in client needs or user needs. The other thing it does is it keeps the specialists specialized. Um, anybody ever, has anyone worked in commercial software development? <laughs> Couple, right? Um, so this is really important, I find. Um, back in the day, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, as a consultant, when we would come into organizations, sometimes we would get pushback from the development team. As a UX practitioner, because the sentiment was, these folks are coming in, they don't know anything about our business, they're coming in to tell us all the things that we did wrong. All the things that they're going to come in, they're going to tell us it's crap, they're going to change everything. And that's never our intent. But I always felt that it was unfair to ask developers to be designers. It's not what they trained for. It's not their priority. Developers should be focused on writing good code. And to ask them to then make sure that the design is effective, efficient, and satisfying, uh, that's above and beyond. And most developers will gladly take on the challenge, but they're not given the tools. So there's something to be said, in my opinion, um, about keeping the specialists specialized so that you are not placing blame on developers for coming up with bad interaction designs, which is what happens a lot. So here, we, we really stop that from happening. Collaboration is so important when you're managing these projects. And, um, when you're collaborating with people, there's, there's two aspects of it. One, you have to learn what they do. So the interaction designers, the visual designers, the motion designers, these folks are my team. They collaborate with each other, and it's my job to make sure that their means of collaboration and their ways of collaborating are open, that I remove any blockers that they may have. In addition to that, we have the business analysts, quality assurance, and development that my team has to collaborate with also. And as much as I can, I need to remove any blockers for these collaborations also. Basically, everybody's trying to get to the same goal. So managing the team means really um, making sure that there is open communication and open collaboration, not only within my team, but between my team and the other teams that they have to work with to get a product out the home. So at this point, we're, if you go through our stages, we're learning, we're conceptualizing, we're validating, we're iterating, we're dealing with research at this point, so we're dealing with the VAs here, um, all throughout technical evaluation, we're dealing with the devs from this point onwards, we're dealing with QA and development here. So all through our process, we are um, collaborating in different degrees with a lot of different types of folks. Robert? Tom, um, you just mentioned BAs. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, when you talked uh, uh, about the interaction designers at first, you talked about them doing lots of UX and you know, um, conceptual sort of work. Yep. Do both the interaction designers and the business analysts work together on that, or do they have separate roles? Um, both, and it depends on the type of engagement. So uh, these folks can be internal to our organization or on our client side. So sometimes we'll, we'll bid on a project and the client will say, well, we have our own devs and our own VAs, et cetera. And then we have to work with them to make sure that our vision and their vision align. Um, but usually, uh, if it's internal to us uh, and we're taking on everything, um, these folks will take a large part of those um, definition and responsibilities that the VAs would do. One of my, my reasons for asking this specifically is that um, we did a fair amount of work some years ago on the, the product owner role in Agile and how that fitted in when UX was an important sort of component. Yes. 
Uh, so in your model here, do you use the term product owner or yes. customer? Yes. And who are they in this model? Are they the BAs or, or what? They are not in this model. I see. Um, so the product owner, so the BAs would report to the product owner. Ah, okay. All right, so the product owner is usually somebody at the director, VP level, um, that's sponsoring um, in, our, in our definition. And then below them, you will have your, what we usually call product managers, which are the people that are responsible for the overall product. And they are often on the client side. Okay, I, I, I've seen this before. I know lots of people in the agile world we think that this is heresy. Right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Simply because the product owner is not there. The product owner is there. Um, we're, we are interacting with the product owner here. Right? When we're going out and we're, and we're learning prior to the research. So we are workshopping with them. Business requirements is kind of outside of here. We match up the business requirements with the user and the customer requirements. And then we move forward. But the product owner is really the gray eminence, right? Yep. Rather than being there in the room. Yes, yes. Sometimes that's an issue. And I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a perfectly good example of something that happened last week where um, we were asked to produce a, uh, a sizzle reel, which is basically a short film clip highlighting um, the new piece of software that we, that we built. That came directly from the product owner. And then we started working with the product managers, et cetera, to define, to storyboard, um, and we follow the same process for a sizzle reel as we would for a piece of software. So we storyboarded it out, sent it off, collaborated, yep, got the check mark, start animating it, finished rough cut, sent it off, yep, got the, got the check mark, sent it to the product owner, yeah, that's great. I collaborated with one of my peers, now I want to make a substantial change. Right? And so <coughs> not having them in those day-to-day -day conversations means that sometimes you get those curveballs from the left yeah. and, and they kind of derail things. But the challenge that we found day-to-day -day is those product owners are usually so high up that they don't have the time to be in the day-to-day -day conversations and they delegate a lot of those to yeah. yeah. And in our studies, which were done in many locations around the world, we found that was totally common. But the consequences you found it is also totally common. Yeah, absolutely. And so, in terms of since we're talking about project project management, you build a certain amount of contingency into your product project plan for those kind of curveballs. Even though we're going to. Vaughn, you had a question. Yeah, I want to go back to something I think you mentioned earlier on when you mentioned that the interaction designer does the research as well. But you mentioned there was also a research group, but they didn't, they kind of reported, they had a different reporting line. Yes. So first, um, how is it working and why did you decide to have the interaction designer do research and design? And when does that research group actually come in and do research and what is different about the research they do? Oh, wow. Okay. So. I mean, we can go for here after. <laughs> You're a jerk because you're asking me political questions. Oh, <laughs> um, oops. Sorry. So, so the short answer is um, I inherited a UX organization that was very, very design focused. And I am currently in the process of building up our research capacity. Uh, okay. Part one of the answer. Part two of the answer is that those researchers in the, in the dotted red square, they their main mandate is to make our software development kit, our SDK, better. But they also are able to, in the process of doing that, um, feed some of their data into our team in order for us to use it and leverage it. So we're getting secondary as opposed to primary data sometimes. Um, and then 
sometimes they also have the cycle to be able to do some primary research for us. Um, and we do work kind of collaboratively. Um, I know that I said that specialization was very good, uh, but on the flip side of that, having a team that's too specialized means that you're not able to respond uh, very quickly to changes in your projects or changes in your pipeline. So another one of my uh, initiatives is getting more cross-disciplinary uh, interaction within our team. So teaching the, the designers how to do research, um, making sure that the researchers understand a little bit about how to do design. Not that it will become their day job, but so that they can interact better and fill gaps if they arise during product, uh, during projects. And so one of the consequences of that is I can lump the red box people in with my regular team in order to produce certain, uh, certain things. And one of the things that they're working on right now is ask them to go back and look at all of the research they've ever done and then extract from that certain certain questions that I've, that I've asked. And so it's bringing the rest of the team together around that research, which I hope will kind of rub off. Sorry, there was a question around here. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, I have two questions, but um, um, a little bit along the same lines as the gentleman. <laughs> Just thinking more on like the agile team in terms of um, you know how do you and maybe you touched on it a little bit um, that uh, um, a multidisciplinary teams where you had you know the the VA or the product owner I understand the product owners up here but um, but a, the business person as part of that team uh, with the developers and the testers and etc. My question is wondering how multidisciplinary teams kind of fits into this and in the efficiencies of it that could have uh, to help remove silos, silos and those barriers that, especially working in the government, we have a bunch of those. So we're kind of looking at ways to have um, some of these key players um, as part of, of a team and, and, and be more active in the day to day. and when there's uh, roadblocks and decisions to be made. We've got somebody in the team to, to facilitate some of those or try and get to some of those answers. So it may not be the product owner, but they, the, the, the VA would have the business speak mm -hmm. and we try and get those answers. So that's one of my, um, part one. And then the, um, and the second part is, um, where is change management in this? Is, is that something that is embedded in the designers or how do you see change management? Good question. Both of them are good questions. Uh, I'll ask, answer the second one first, and then come back to the first one. Uh, change. One of the things that we use is the Google Suite. We don't use Microsoft. It does things like Google Suite. Um, change management is not like formal change management as a discipline of practice. Is not often part of our project. And the reason is that we're not often doing substantial change to the way that a business works. We are not doing substantial change to their product offering necessarily. Part of our value proposition is that we can come in and do the single code base so you don't have to spin up teams for all of these different platforms that you want to, to be on. So a lot of the times our goal is to not be disruptive terms of uh, changing to work patterns, etc. Um, and so we don't necessarily, that's not one of our core competencies, but if we see that there are major changes, we certainly recommend that we bring uh, change management in, but it's not, it's not really core to us. Number two, um, the multidisciplinary teams um, being responsive The idea of multidisciplinary teams and bringing in somebody like the VA can be more responsive, more responsive to business requirements and potential changes in business requirements. Uh, that's a double-edged sword. Um, it's like that game of telephone, right? and the more people that you involve in that game, uh, I find that the greater the chance that something is miscommunicated. 
So having that executive product owner and having a clear line of sight into them and a line of communication sometimes saves uh, us a little trouble because we've had examples where you know the, the VA that is the voice of the product owner within the team has certain marching orders. You listen to this person going off down the road. Oh, we forgot to tell you we changed that direction two weeks ago at the executive level that nobody told this person. Right? So it, it is a double-edged sword in that it can be very helpful or it can steer you off the course. Um, but I think the, the key is making sure that if you're communicating with that VA and that VA is the voice of the product owner, that you're still at regular intervals validating that connection between the VA and the product owner. And being multidisciplinary, um, I don't want you to think that everybody has to know how to do everybody else's job. Um, that's hard to accomplish. But yeah, you should have an appreciation and understanding of how everybody's job fits together. And in order to have this part goes smoothly, uh, it does require having alignment up front about what the business objectives are. So having that, that product owner and having somebody that can be the voice of that product owner throughout this process is very valuable. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's just sometimes I find challenges um, because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Yep. Right? Often and most times. Most times, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so sometimes I find with the business side of things, you know, they, they sort of have that attitude where, you know, I'm here if you need me. Mm -hmm. um, yep. and, and Always. It's, it's, it, yeah, Don't exactly. bug me and unless you need to bug me. Exactly. So it's, it's difficult trying to ask the right questions and know what questions to ask sometimes and to, for them to, you know, try and articulate what we're yep. trying to get. So that's why I was... And that kind of ties back to Ron's does, question yeah. because... We don't, we don't rely on that business analyst, especially if they're client side, to tell us the full story. This is what we want to accomplish. We need a big red button in the middle of the screen. And these guys need to ask the question, why do you need a big red button? What's the purpose? What are you trying to achieve? How does that feed back into your business goals? How does that feed back into your KPIs? How does that represent your brand, et cetera? So they're, they're teasing those questions out of the VA. And if the VA doesn't have those questions, then we have to go up. So we don't, we don't ever assume that this person has all of those strategic answers about the direction that the organization wants to go in. Yeah, but even just at the initial stages, because that's where we are with, with our product that we're working on, is even just understanding the current business, mm -hmm. understanding the current business model. So, you know, we're, uh, not that we're having challenges, but they're just, they're not very, uh, because, and, and not to blame anybody, they, they know this like the back of their head, right? right? So we're just a little eerie that maybe we're left in the dark in some pieces and we're going to go down this path that it wasn't quite right, but I mean, it, it, it is what yeah. it is. It's, it is what it is. Yeah. And, you know, you're in a safe space here. Yeah. We all have challenges. Yeah. Um, but kind of, you know, this is, a, this is a little bit misleading in that it looks like this is the only place that we iterate, but there, there really should be loops throughout this because there's always that check mark. There's always that, you know, are we, are we getting it right? Are we getting it right? Are we getting it right? And the more often that we check back and you get the client, and I don't, I don't know if the, the client paradigm um, applies uh, in your specific instance, um, but the more often that you get that validation from the client uh, as you're going through the process, the, you're reducing the, um, the opportunity to go off course. Right? And so we, we really, communication, communication, communication is one of those, those things. And it builds up a trust, it builds up a rapport. I'm going to talk in, in a little while about uh, our culture um, and why communication is such, and collaboration is such a really big part of our culture. It's getting people comfortable with talking to Think back to you know the, the layers that were in my org chart. Anyone in the org chart in our organization can talk to the product owner on our client side. There's no, oh no, 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 you're just a little junior person, you can't have access to that person. Um, we want that collaboration. And our clients appreciate it because you know it reduces the 
if they ask me a question, well, I gotta go ask my manager, my manager has to go ask their, their report, right? So if they can ask the direct report and get the answer right away, that just shortens everything. So that idea that there's hierarchy, we're really against that. We want the people that can answer the questions in the room with the product owners so that they can, they can have those conversations firsthand and reduce as much of the churn and potential for misinterpretation as possible. I'm getting there. Um, so the challenges. Um, many of the challenges were just articulated in the questions that, that I just answered. But um, part of it is maintaining that 50,000 foot view. Uh, to me, it's very important that everybody on the team has an idea of what the project looks like. Because that gives you a perspective of how much effort you're going to devote to, to any one thing. Someone put it, you know, uh, which hills are worth dying on, right? What you're going to fight to the death for, or what you're going uh, to let go, because in the grand scheme of things, it's not that important. So a challenge is maintaining that 50,000 foot view. If you're so focused on the wireframes, or you're so focused on the motion design that you're forgetting what comes next, or forgetting who's upstream or downstream from you, then uh, then sometimes you, you lose your sense of perspective. Your contribution, whatever your role is on the team, affects people. People um, take your output, and you take other people's output in order to do your job. And so having that 50,000 foot view is very important, and maintaining it is always a challenge. Building relationships with other departments. They have different operational priorities. They have different KPIs. KPIs, everyone know what I mean by KPIs? No. KPIs are key performance indicators. They are metrics or measurements by which we define whether um, an organization is being successful or not. A general KPI in business is how much money am I making, right? So if I'm making a lot of money, that means the business is going well. If I'm making a little bit of money, it's bad. We don't necessarily measure that down at our level because there's different levels of KPIs. Uh, at the organizational level, client number of clients, satisfaction with your product, amount of money that you're making. But for the UX team, what might be some KPIs that we would look for? Do we have an idea? Client satisfaction, right? So when we're dealing with the client, um, how satisfied are they with their interaction with us? Would, yeah, absolutely client satisfaction. Um, anybody do usability testing here? Yep. So what do you measure when you're doing a usability test? Task completion times? error rates, things like that, those can be KPIs that are granular enough at our level to, to matter. They don't matter so much at the corporate level, but they feed into other KPIs at the departmental level that might feed into other KPIs at the corporate level. So that's very important. That's another reason why building relationships with other departments is very important because they might affect your KPIs, either upstream or downstream. So it's important that you have those relationships with go and talk to the test team and say, oh, hey, you know, you guys can go through to submission to the App Store and there were some UX bugs. Oh, well, UX bugs aren't really part of our test script. All right, well, how can we work with you to make sure that, that we get a chance to test the UX before you submit? Right? So it's about building those relationships. Uh, with your first bullet, about keeping that vision alive so everybody um, has that shared view. Do you use, like how do you use your um, space for that? Do you post storyboards around? How do you keep it live uh, rather than just it's in a slide deck buried on my hard drive somewhere? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great uh, question. Um, <coughs> and I wish I had more pictures of our, our space. But if you've ever been to our office, you'll notice that there's like two areas, right? Tamara's been there, she knows. So you walk in the front door at UITV, and there's a statue of Yoda to your left, and then you turn to your right, and there's the UX team. That's where, that's where I sit, that's where Zara sits, that's where Jingyi uh, sits. Uh, but that's only half of the team. The other half of the team is upstairs with the project teams, and they're embedded in different project teams. 
each of those project teams, um, they have their own space where they have their boards up uh, with issues and blockers. Um, they have their own stand-up areas, uh, etc. So the design of the space is very, very key to uh, to collaboration. I'll show you a couple of pictures and then about what what our space looks like. How much time do I have? Good. Yeah, it's hard to do that. If you're designing a cubicle in. Yes, we don't have cubicles. There you go. Which has its own challenges, right? Yeah. So um, was it Harvard that, that kind of came up with definitive proof this year that the open concept environment actually doesn't work for productivity? <laughs> Shocker. Shocker. <laughs> Shocker. And a lot of you know hip um, technology companies have these vast open concept uh, offices. And so a balance has to be struck between soul destroying cubicle land and open concept mayhem when you're planning your study. John, you asked about time, and I just want to let you know it's 1.30 now. Uh -huh. and we have you scheduled to 2.30, right? And then the Q&A, so you've got lots of time. I didn't know if you wanted to take a short break and people could grab some nosh. Sure, let's do that. My voice is not going to be until 2.30. <laughs> All right, so let's do that game. There's some food there. Well, then when we have some take sponsor. a Yeah. If you won't eat, I will. Um, just to finish up my point about building relationships with other departments, which is really caused uh, for us great. Uh, very, very important uh, that you have a relationship with other departments. Um, there are departments who you, as the UX manager, depend on. There are departments who depend on you. Um, and for example, we have a uh, customer success organization. So we have a, a set of customer success managers. Their goals very closely align with ours. So our goals are to represent our users and uh, user requirements. Their goals are to represent and so I have found that working with them quite closely is beneficial to people. Uh, going out and introducing yourselves, getting them a tour of your department, meeting your people, those types of things are really worthwhile endeavors building these relationships. We kind of take it for granted that we're all on the same team. But this myopia that I'm talking about. Not everyone has the chance to kind of lift their head up from the grindstone and look around and appreciate the forest. Right? Sometimes we're a little bit more focused on the trees than we are on the forest. So being able to, to take people out of their environment and, and sit down and have a real conversation with them and build relationships really helps solidify this idea that we are really working to achieve because in an organization, I know that some organizations are bigger than others, it's sometimes hard to keep in mind when there's tens of thousands of people in your organization that this person and that person are trying to achieve the same thing when they keep kind of running hands over them. So building these relationships are, it, it's very important. And when it comes to running hands, I'm not going to pretend building relationships means that you're not going to butt heads. When it comes to butting heads, you can have these frank and open and honest conversations because you've had some kind of relationship build up with that person and there, there's less uh, potential for misinterpreting what you're saying, etc., etc. So having those relationships even helps when there's conflict, when you can actually sit down and just lay it all on the table and still go and have a beer out. Next one is about investing the time to educate other groups about UX. And this is sometimes the hard one because very few of us have this in our job description. Right? So this is something that's done on top of your regular nine to five. And taking the time to do this is something that you have to figure out a way of fitting into your day on top of everything. But this really, really matters because
because a lot of people have preconceptions about UX and what it is, rightly or wrong. So Ron asked me a question, and I called him a jerk, um, because it, answering that question required me to dig up a little bit of a, a politics uh, that happens sometimes. And one of the things that I found coming into UI is that educating people about what UX is is very important because I'm actually in the process of changing what the UX team is. And so there are a lot of people who have an idea of what the UX team is, and their idea is not wrong because it's what the UX team used to be. And so a UX team with more research capability, a UX team that's equipped to validate their design decisions, qualitative and quantitative research, a UX team that knows about and takes on things like information architecture is a very different thing than a UX team that just draws pretty pictures. Now a lot of people think of the UX team as, oh, you're the guys that do the front end. You're the guys that make things look nice. Right? So making sure that they kind of understand, hey, I can help you. I can give you the data to make your decisions. I can help guide your developers in terms of what decisions to make based on the user needs. Uh, those types of things are really important. So taking the time, and, and you know, this is not about a flippant choice of words, investing the time. You actually have to invest the time to educate. Some people are going to see UX as a nice to have, as a luxury, and other people are going to see it as a strategically vital function within an organization. I have my bias about which, which of those two are true. Um, but the people that are over here who have quite a light view of UX are never going to change their minds until they're given the proper information, the proper data to which to make up their mind. So your job, well, excuse me, your job, or in this case my job, is to make sure that those folks are educated. And I actually have to you know, do a little roadshow. When I started at UI, I spent an entire month, my entire first month, just meeting with leads. Meeting all the VPs, meeting all the directors, meeting, meeting all the C-suite, sitting down with them one-on-one -on -one and explaining to them, these are the things I can do. Not just for the organization, but for your group, for your team, for your department, So they have a better understanding. This is how I can help sales. I can help go in and do um, ideation, product definition, innovation workshops to help narrow the requirements even before you start pitching and contracting. So these are the types of things that we can integrate into and give people better understanding of what the UX team does. A big part of managing the team is managing workflow. Uh, this is the day-to-day. -day. So um, a lot of the stuff that I talked about before, about the projects, how they're staffed, how they're organized, the communication, um, the education, that may not be your day-to-day -day job as a manager of the UX project. But in terms of the day-to-day, -day, um, we're doing certain things all the time. Reviews, internal to the UX team, reviews with a larger project team, pre-grooming, this is your user stories for your sprints, backlog grooming, sprint planning. Right? Those are kind of day-to-day cross-functional activities that the teams do on an ongoing basis. And you'll see by the check marks and the bold of the people that I'm responsible for who they have to collaborate with on a day-to-day -day basis as they go through those sprints, the planning, the execution, um, the backlog from the creator of those sprints. You may guess what I'm about to say next, but again, on a day-to-day -day basis, when you're looking at the team's workflow, collaboration, again, is at the center of that. Communication is at the center of that. We are in a multidisciplinary um, domain by definition, right? And there, UX is such a broad thing that um, your 
teams are going to be different than my teams in terms of makeups and skill sets. Um, but communication and collaboration, this is probably something that's central to everybody. It's very important to understand that when you're going through these stages, you're not just going through them within your own discipline or even within your own team, but it's cross-functional across everybody. So at a high level, on a project level, also on a day-to-day -day level. So when we do stand-ups, it's not just what well, we do have a weekly stand-up every Monday morning with the UX team. But the daily stand-ups are well, kind of because it's scrum, but the daily stand-ups are all these people, all these people, right? The reviews, and the spread planning, everybody's involved. If anybody here do waterfall, you guys do waterfall or some, some mix? Government loves waterfall. Is that a bad waterfall. question to ask? <laughs> Government loves waterfall. We're trying to change things. But yeah, there's um, a team you do. Both. Both? <laughs> waterfall <laughs> moving towards Agile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Government's an expert at hybrid. Right? Pardon me? Yeah, Government's exactly. an expert at hybrid. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's we, we, don't, we don't want to make a decision on yeah, either. Exactly. So we'll do both. <laughs> well, it's a challenge because senior management, you know, seem to prefer the waterfall and it's, it's always challenge to educate senior managers so that's why you kind of find something to do with you. <laughs> Absolutely. Even if you do waterfall, right? Even if you do waterfall or gate or any of the other type of um, methodologies, collaboration and communication are equally important. I would argue if you do a waterfall, collaboration and communication is even more important because the temptation in a waterfall Oh, I'm done my bit. Here you go. Right? And that's where things start to fall apart at those transition points. So being able to kind of get the people that are on the next level involved in your process as you're winding down so they can see the challenges you face, the things that you've done, have a very soft handoff to them, and then maybe kind of hang around as they start their own process to see if they have questions or comments. That type of thing makes even waterfall look bigger and more smoothly. So it doesn't matter if you're doing uh, an agile methodology or a, or a more traditional methodology, you still want to focus on communication and collaboration. Now, everything that I do seems to have different layers. Right? So within my IXD team, within my VID team, within my mod team, I'm dealing with I'm looking for their strengths, I'm looking for their weaknesses. Not everybody, not every interaction designer, not every motion designer, not every visual designer is creative. <coughs> I feel a coughing bit coming up. interaction designers created. So what you want to do is understand the strengths and the weaknesses of every individual so you can mix and match at this level. In terms of your teams, <coughs> honestly, I think I have to take five. All right, resume conversations, oh, Thank you for bearing with me through that. Um, when you're being recorded, it's best not to you know, dissolve into a teary, Coughing, packing, mess. So, as I was saying, these folks are different, right? When I say I, there are interaction designers, there's not one monolithic type of interaction designers. These are people. Or, <laughs> these are people, and those people have strengths, they have weaknesses, they have personalities, they have likes, they have dislikes. Um, they get along with each other, they don't get along with each other. Part of the project planning 
is kind of mixing and matching the skill sets, the personalities, the aptitudes to create an optimal team. And that is actually kind of one of the things I enjoy most about the job, kind of putting together these amazing teams of people to work on projects. And you and you, oh, you and you, we need to collaborate. Zara is an unfortunate victim of that. Uh, Sorry, you need to work with this person. Yeah. And so, um, for me, it is, it's one of the things that I enjoy, seeing kind of this organic cross-pollination that happens when people that have different backgrounds and different skill sets work together and they learn from each other and they grow as, as people. So, um, th there's always a human component to managing these projects. Part of that is also understanding that these folks, as they go through these steps for their day-to-day -day activities, as they go through the project activities, they're learning and they're growing too. So part of, um, part of managing these teams is also creating opportunities for people to grow, for people to spread their wings, for people to try new things and experience new things. So I have visual designers who've come to me and said, you know what, I really kind of want to try my hand at interaction design. I've been working with these guys for a long time. I've learned some things. I think I can do the wireframes on this project. Go. Go ahead and do it. If you mess it up, I'm here. But what I never want to say is, no, you're an interaction, you're a visual designer, get back in your lane. Right? That's frustrating. Um, it doesn't count for growth, and it's, it's not very inspirational. I'd rather have somebody try something and fail than not try, or worse yet, feel that the environment is not supportive of them to try. And there is a benefit to me as the director of the group. The more cross-pollination I have here, I've mentioned this before, the more options I have when I'm putting together that amazing team, right? If I have an interaction designer that can do visual design, or a visual designer that can do interaction design, that gives me more options as to who I can assign to different tasks on every team. So having that kind of a team dynamic where people feel comfortable and confident trying new things and having that organic cross-pollination actually works in my favor for my objective. People learn things from outside the organization also. And I was telling um, Ron a little while ago, uh, he had a question during the break about unicorns. And when you leave Carlton and go out into the workforce, you're going to see job descriptions that are garbage. Sorry, they're ridiculous, right? Um, they're going to ask you to design and research and test and code and do QA. And, you know, and oh, by the way, if you could also play the violin and you know, type 60 words, and you know, they're they're like you're gonna see some 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 job descriptions, and you're gonna look at them and go, this is ridiculous. Nobody is born a unicorn. Unicorns are made. Unicorns are made in very very specific environments. And those environments are environments where people chance to blossom and a chance to grow. Right? So that's that's an important thing to create um, create these opportunities. When I talk about communication and collaboration, as you're creating opportunities to grow, you also have to create opportunities to collaborate and to communicate. And there is a procedural way to do so. And then there is a physical way to do so. I'm going to show you some pictures um, in a few slides of what our, um, our space is like. I just have a couple pictures. Uh, but in terms of design phases, these are kind of the, the places or, or the, the stages at which we communicate a lot. And these are the formal stages. There is, of course, the informal part where everybody can get up and wander around. Our building is circular. Um, well, no. Our building is a circuit. It's not a circle. <laughs> uh, we're 
not happen. But we can, you know, you can start in one place and keep walking and end up back in that same place. And so you can take different routes to get to the cafe or to get to your meeting room. You can walk through the project area or you can walk through the test areas so and you can see people. Everything is out in the open so you can see them and talk to them. So there are a lot of informal opportunities, but you can't rely on those informal opportunities for collaboration and communication. So within a project, we have these formal um, points at which the teams need to get together. Up front, we have project discovery. And project discovery happens very, very early on in the projects. Um, this is usually a fun phase because this generally involves the client, and um, almost none of our clients are in Canada. So <laughs> you get to you know, go, um, whether it's you know, New York or LA or Houston or somewhere, and um, meet with the clients, and understand what their goals are, what their objectives are for the project, the users, the marketplace, um, what research they have, and kind of get the whole team on the same page. And so, a lot of the times it's the managers that are going to these. Um, I, every once in a while, you know, there, there's nobody that's restricted from going to these meetings. Then we take this, we bring it back to the team. So we're introducing the UX team that we've chosen, so a subset of those interaction, visual, emotion designers. We're introducing them to the project. We're relating what we learned here to the rest of the Team. We're prepping them for the upcoming design sprints. We are um, we're taking the overall project goals and objectives, and we're distilling out what the UX objectives and the UX goals are. So, if a client says, "Well, we want more viewers," that's our objective. We're redesigning our app, or we're designing this new app because we want to attract more viewers to our channel. Here, we want to start our designers thinking about what are the things that we can do to attract or retain or whatever the goal is. We want to start thinking about them then. Then we unleash them, right? Brainstorming. How many people have run a brainstorming session? What are the rules of brainstorming? Ooh, I got gotcha. you. First rule is there are no rules. This is not Fight Club. This is a brainstorm. Um, how many people knew there were rules to brainstorm? Robert did, right? Um, quantity, not quality, right? There's no bad ideas. Don't argue about other people's ideas. You don't argue. So that's the most important one. The word, but, cannot be used in a brainstorming session. Replace it with the word and, right? Because a lot of the times we kind of turn, off, turn up our passive aggressive meter, right? I mean, that's a great idea, but, which is really a way of saying, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> but it's not a terrible idea, because there are no terrible ideas in brainstorming, right? That's a great idea, and. Why do we need rules around brainstorming? It's not the Wild West. We're looking to explore concepts and ideas around the problems that we're trying to solve. And to be successful at that, we're going to have to know the rules of what we're doing. There's great books, great resources. They'll kind of teach you how to brainstorm. Robert's a good resource. Um, but you want to make sure that you're brainstorming collaboratively and productively. Because that Brainstorm output feeds into the rest of everything else. So you're supporting your team in this way, you're making sure that this is a positive collaborative experience, you are coming up with ideas, you're rapidly iterating and ideating here, and then you're coming up with a vision. That might seem pretty wishy-washy at the project you're managing a UX project, why do you need a vision for the project team? Hmm. 
organizations have vision statements, right? Mission statements. Why is it important to have a vision? One input for me, the most important thing that uh, I've seen you working with people is that you develop this common language that you leverage from that point on. Exactly. Exactly. You're all you're pointing everyone in the same direction. You're establishing this common language. It is it is a common understanding of what it is that you're trying to achieve. And that vision becomes your north star. So as you go through the rest of the project. You have something to look back at when you think you might be going off course or somebody else is going off course. You're getting down into the weeds and you're getting myopic and you're looking at the trees and you forget to look at the forest. Then you can, oh, this is our vision. This is what we're trying to achieve and why. So having that vision and having that collaborative um, exercise to get to that vision, it may not seem very useful here. But as you progress through the rest of the project, being able to call back to that, hey, this is what we're trying to achieve, is very important. From there, you want to plan out your weekly meetings. And sometimes they're not weekly meetings. Sometimes they're once every two weeks, depending on the size and the scale and the scope of the project. Um, <laughs> if things are not going very well, sometimes they're daily meetings. Uh, but you, what is that meeting cadence like? What are the touch points? Who are you meeting with? Um, we have a, a question from one of the remote participants. Hey guys. Kyle says, for brainstorming, do you use a preferred method to help guide the session? Examples like 6.3.5 and morphologic? Um, yeah, those are actually fun. Um, <laughs> no, I don't have a preferred um, method. It depends on the group. One, um, one that works really well for me, there's two that actually work really well for me that I use. Uh, one is the bad idea on purpose, right? Where you come up, instead of coming up with a good idea for brainstorming, everybody tries to come up with a terrible idea, right? And what that does is it helps take the pressure off for, uh, for creating a good idea. So let's say, let's, let's try it. Let's say we're redesigning the iPhone. What's a terrible idea for a new phone design? Physical keyboard. A physical keyboard. <laughs> Ouch, you went there. <laughs> physical keyboard, right? That's another terrible idea. Remove the headphone jack. <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> One of our remote participants says no screen. No screen, right? So physical keyboard, remove the headphone jack, no screen. Remember, there's no bad ideas. Well, these are bad ideas. Think about then the, the challenge in that exercise is to flip that bad idea into a good idea. So if there was no screen, well, then there would have to be multimodal ways of input and output, which is always a good idea when you're designing, right? So that's something good that you can take out of that very bad idea. So the idea there in that brainstorming exercise is to come up with bad ideas and see if there's anything good that you can extract from them. The other one that you can do is um, it's either a two by two matrix or, um, or opposites, right? What would be uh, what would be the implication if this cost one dollar? What would be the implication if it cost a million dollars? What would be the implication if it weighed a pound? Or what would be the implication if it weighed fifty pounds? Right. So so you have a spectrum that you're working on, and you work with you know what the implications are of opposite ends of those spectrums. So there's all sorts of resources online that you can find that will help you, uh, that will give you frameworks to help you brainstorm. Oh, man. I think this is Google's subtle way of telling me I'm talking too much. Next slide. No, Google, I resist you. So your weekly meetings, um, your brainstorming, did that answer the question, by the way? Uh, I think so. We all had a good laugh, but there is another one. Another thing, does he use QFDs in his design process? And Kyle says, yes, he did, thank you. All right, QFDs. Um, 
QFDs? What are QFDs? And I probably don't since I'm asking what a QFD is. Uh, quality functional deployment. Quality function deployment. Quality function deployment. Um, nope, I do not. Okay. Um, I've been sent an image, but I, I don't. Uh, it's oh. a, some sort of template, yeah? Yep. Cool. No, I do not use those. All right. <laughs> so, um, in terms of the weekly meetings, cadence, who is attending, uh, review of upcoming sprints, review of builds, there's all sorts of reasons why you want to meet on a regular basis, right? Um, and it, it's just a way of bringing the project team together and making sure that you're functioning properly. And then another one is approvals. As you go through certain stages, if you remember, the uh, end-to-end the -end project process that I showed where those check marks, those are, the, those are the approvals, right? And this is where you're engaging client-side project team members, your internal project team members, to go over uh, those approvals that you need to move on to the next stage. So these are reasons why you should gather formalized reasons, but like I mentioned before, there are also informal The last thing I want to talk about here are tools and Q, QFDs. <laughs> right? there, there are tools. And one of the things that I like about my job is I, I no longer have to try and keep up with all of the tools that are on the market. It's exhausting. Right? There are so many tools for wireframing. And there are so many tools for prototyping and design and communication. How many people use Slack? Right? I use Slack every day. I live on Slack. I have Slack on my phone, on my iPad, on all of my computers. Uh, my watch is constantly buzzing. Um, I hate Slack. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> I really do, um, but it is absolutely essential, right? It's a great way of communicating with the client. We have Slack channels where we invite our clients to. Um, we have uh, project-based Slack channels. We have department-based Slack channels. Um, at UI, there's a Slack channel for whenever there's free food in the <laughs> office, right? So that, I don't hate Slack so much when, when that one dings. But you know, Slack is a, uh, it's a major way of communicating right now. But prior to Slack being in existence, we used things like Skype, right? Apparently Skype was really fallen out of favor. Um, we probably don't remember MSN Messenger or those kind of things. But there were ways. Um, sketch. Um, this is the Adobe Creative Cloud. So or After Effects, or InDesign, etc. Um, Envision, uh, Proto, we use our own engine to build. Uh, Slack, Google Drive, Confluence. We also use Jira, um, Stack Overflow. There's, there's so many things on the market. Now, one of the things that um, is kind of dangerous when you're leveraging these tools is fragmentation and, and losing things, right? So um, not only do we have Drive, but we have, uh, the UX team has its own Dropbox, right? And sometimes I don't know if something's on Drive or on Dropbox, and there's no kind of rules about what to put where. So, you know, you're kind of looking for things. That's the downside of it. But the upside of it is that there's so many things that can help you communicate and collaborate. We deal with a lot of teams that are located in different places. So our clients will have people in three or four different locations around the world. We will have people in three or four different locations around the world. But they all get on Google Meetups and we can have them at a video conference and have a chat together and it's, and it's fine. Right? And so uh, this isn't an endorsement of any of these tools. These are just the things that we use. Um, there are hundreds more out there that do exactly the same thing. Um, I 
honestly can't give you a really good explanation as to why we use Sketch and not Adobe XD or OmniGraffle. Um, they all do exactly the same thing. Whatever you're comfortable with, whatever your budget affords, um, and whatever allows you the greatest opportunity for collaboration and communication. But there are tools out there. There are no excuses that you can make that, well, this person's over here, so I can't talk to them, or that file's too big, so I can't share it. There's you know, literally hundreds of, of solutions. Do you use anything like Trello or Zenho? Yes. <laughs> we also use Trello. I just, on a personal note, because I have suffered some of these experiences, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like you said, there are no rules about where things are stored. For I guess, us. So, yeah, yeah but, but in the open world, so that's, I guess I'm inquiring. So we do have a presentation on April 2nd on data management. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I should I'll probably be here. <laughs> but I'm just wondering if anybody knows of any evolving rules about these type of issues, right? When do you slap over Skype? Because in some environments you're using Go. You know, when do you use Drive over, Dropbox? You know, size might be an indicator, but I just wondered if you had encountered any, even if they didn't work, any functional rules. Um, the only functional rules that I, I know of, are our decisions are usually based on access. So for example, when we're, when we're dealing with government clients, or in my past life, when we were dealing with government clients, we couldn't use Google Drive. Right? because a lot of them didn't have, they weren't able to access uh, Google Drive from their government email addresses. Um, when we are dealing with some of our clients, they can't use Google Meetup, so we have to use their BlueJeans account, or all of our video conferencing and teleconferencing is through Google. And you know, so sometimes they just don't work with your client's infrastructure or the other people that you're working with. So a lot of the times it's finding something that works for both. Okay, thank you. I don't know about you guys, if there's things that you love to use or hate to use. Um, how many of you like Slack? What do you hate about it? What do I hate about it? Um, is the proliferation of channels for me and the layers. Right? So I have a, a UI TV Slack. Um, I have uh, IMT6. Slack for that, and under those there's like 100 channels, and under those there's people, it's just, it's hard. So then my, so then my follow-up question is, do you have some sort of system, because you have information in Flux, right, mm -hmm. on how to manage that? Because you're talking, we're here about managing Managing project, project, right? And I, I, again, this is something that in my world years ago, I struggle with. Years ago, I did a project for, um, I think it was Natural Resources Canada. The manager that I was dealing with there had a really interesting system. She only checked her email twice a day. So she checked it at like 10 o'clock in the morning for half an hour and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And the reason that she did that was so that she could focus on getting her work done and was not responding every five minutes to an email that came in. With the proliferation of things like Slack, and this is, this is something that's, that's kind of universal, it's the same thing for messaging or, or instant messaging, there's an expectation that I am sending you something that I want you to respond or that my expectation is that you will respond to right away. All right? And part of the whole reason that Slack exists is that's kind of a value prop. Um, so the answer is no. I don't have any special tricks. But what I find is that people are more and more expecting that you are plugged into these things all the time, and that your responses are kind of commensurate. So there are unwritten rules that have evolved. If I don't need an immediate answer, I will send an email. If I need an immediate answer, or a more immediate answer, I will send a Slack. Right? If it's something really long, I'll put it in an email. If it's short, I'll put it in a Slack. If I'm sending a file, well, heaven help you, because I can <laughs> send it anyway. Um, so, you know, there's kind of these unwritten rules that are, that are evolving, but we really are expecting people to be able to respond you know, instantly in all situations. And that kind of creates some interesting dynamics, right? Um, 
we sit in meetings and someone's presenting and somehow it has, not, it has become not rude that everybody in the meeting is on their phone, right? The assumption is that they're slacking and you know, you're hearing things in the meeting and you're sending off instructions to your team right away and suddenly it's not rude for everybody in the, in the meeting to be on their phone like this as the meeting's going on. So those dynamics are shifting. A couple of years ago, I was at a, um, a meeting with me, uh, a couple of my directors uh, were meeting with PricewaterhouseCoopers, and this was kind of just as wearables were coming out, and one of my colleagues was getting email messages to his phone, coming in on his smartwatch, and as our client was talking, <laughs> he kept doing that. <laughs> So after our meeting, it was like, dude, you cannot do that in a meeting. It looked like you were bored and impatient. The whole, I knew he was reading emails, but our client didn't know that because every two minutes he was, you know, checking his watch. So, you know, the, the, the mores and, and the things that are socially acceptable in terms of collaboration, in terms of communication, are changing because of these tools and because of the technology. So we do have to be careful uh, about that. And yeah, we, I won't lie, we haven't kind of figured out what the most efficient, best way. I still don't know what goes on Confluence versus Jira versus Trello versus, you know, it's just people pick what they like and, and we just have to go and search for what we need, right? And that's, that's kind of a, that's kind of one of the things that we're trying to, uh, trying to solve. This is the last bit. This is the funnest bit. Um, because design teams have evolved to have this kind of um, uh, ethos around to them where you are the cool kids because you're part of the design team, right? I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember Sprockets. Um, yeah. This is how we dance. No, I won't dance. Um, but like Sprockets, there are these guys in the black turtlenecks and the big chunky black glasses. Um, there is this, you know, I'm a designer type thing that kind of goes on where people think, ah, I'm part of a cool kid set. I would like to argue against that. When you're managing teams, <laughs> like why? This is our one chance to be the cool kids after all this time. Um, it's a barrier to collaboration, right? Because if you're the cool kids, then there are some not cool kids somewhere, right? And that might be a little bit intimidating for people. And if they see you as special or on pedestal, when everybody's actually working together to try and get the same thing done. So I actually, um, I actively fight against and work against this, this idea that we are different from the developers, right? So it, it, I don't know if you've got any, so these, these guys are team members of mine. So you know, the studded wristband and the tattoos and, you know, they're creative, they're different. But I'm constantly pushing them to don't just hang out with the other tattooed wristband wearing people integrate, talk to people, build those interpersonal relationships, because that's important. Our culture of collaboration needs to be lived, and it needs to be visible. So I mentioned when you walk in the front doors of our, our building, the UX team is right there, and kind of behind the UX team off to the left is a whiteboard, right? Right next to Zara's desk. <laughs> so, um, most of the time, I'll show you in a minute, most of the time it's just graffiti on the whiteboard. <laughs> uh, but the whiteboard is plain and open, visible to everybody so that they can see us working and collaborating. So this gentleman right here is Jason, Jason Flick. He's the CEO of UITV. And what he's actually doing is working through the storyboard with the UX team 
you know, just kind of passing by, and they're like, hey, Jason, come, come jam with us, right? And so there isn't that hierarchy. There isn't, oh, I'm a designer, and you're the CEO. I, I cannot <laughs> talk to you. There isn't any of that, right? Um, and we're not doing this in a black box. There's no magic to what we do. We're doing it in full view. You know, you know when you go to these restaurants and it's got an open view of the kitchen? Right? And you can sit from your table and see into the kitchen and see what's going on. I actually like those kinds of restaurants because you know you're relatively sure your food is not going to get spat in or something if you can actually see what they're doing in the kitchen. It's the same principle here. The kitchen is open. It's open for everyone to see, for everybody to walk by. Or going to drop it. There is no magic. There are no secrets in what we do, so that we can really integrate well with the team of the organization. Uh, anyone whether to ask me to turn off the camera at this point. <laughs> um, so this is this is what our whiteboard looks like most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> He's Sorry. Like, like, do you want me to? John, you you want the camera off? No, I'm joking. Okay. Oh, okay. Just I'll, I'll tell you when I need an offer. <laughs> um, this is what it looks like most of the time. This is also a way of collaborating. So kind of every week we set a theme and people just come and they doodle. And this isn't just, it is in our area and most of the doodles are UX people. But it's really gratifying to see them, you know, hey, come put something on our board to just, you know, anybody that's walking by. And we see these, and they evolve over a week. Like somebody will start something, and people just walk by and take a break and doodle something for five minutes, and it'll grow, 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 and then I'm probably it gets erased. And then they start over again on Monday. And you would think, as the director, you see four or five people standing around doodling on a whiteboard, they're like, yo, get back to work! <laughs> Um, no, I actually, I really encourage that. Um, again, it's collaboration, it's communication, it's a creative outlet, and it's, it's, it's a team building exercise, and it allows them the opportunity um, to, uh, to, to bring people in. This is a nook, a nook that we have upstairs. Like all of these walls, by the way, have whiteboard uh, paint on them. This is not a, um, an endorsement of people writing on walls. Don't go back to your organizations and start writing on the walls because you saw it in my slide. There are special walls. Right? But the special walls are part of the whole culture thing, right? Where we can sit in the nook and work out the initial drafts or the initial sketches and wireframes for what we need to design. And this is one, two, three, there is a most five people that were working on how we might visualize some of the features of the client asked for. Why is it important to have five people working on the wireframes as opposed to one? No idea. We can catch each other's mistakes or catch offer each other's mistakes, solutions. Get stuck. Hey, how would you do this? set of eyes, fresh set of eyes, um, the, the collaboration really strengthens the delivery. Right? And so again, I encourage this, I encourage people to get together, brainstorming, sketching out how um, things are going to come together. One person will take all of these ideas and start working them into wireframes, but for that initial push to get the project going, sure, bring as many people as you want if you've got time. It's creating the spaces for collaboration. It is creating the culture where it's not seen as a bad thing to take five minutes from what you've been assigned to do to go help somebody out and, and come with some wireframes, et cetera. And it really builds that bond. This is a fish tank. It's our fish tank. Built it, right? They assembled it. 
pulled the stand, they brought in the plates, they bought all the food, they bought the fish, they maintained it. We have mascots in our area, um, a tank full of really cool fish. And um, what has happened lately, oh, this is going on YouTube, right? Um, what has happened lately is there's so many fish in here that people actually started putting little tanks on their desks. You know, like there's like, there's fish all throughout <laughs> my apartment. <laughs> um, hopefully, nobody's going to get in trouble. Uh, but, you know, it's the little things that help build the culture, right? That help make the team a team. And that actually reflects and plays out in um, when, when you are heads down, when you do have that project to deliver, when you do have those difficult clients to deal with. Heads with internal groups, it helps with that cohesion and it helps with that, um, that directionality to have uh, these interpersonal relationships that you can fall back on, or these ways to blow off steam, or things that you can talk about that aren't project related. It helps move all of those things forward. So, building the culture to me, it's about enabling the things that your team likes to do, the things that make them a team without setting them apart and making them so isolated that they are that they are intimidating to other groups. And it's also about having a physical space and creating a physical space that supports what you want that team to be in terms of collaboration and in terms of so all of those things come together in the management of teams. It's both process we we have tagline at UIT, that what we do is both art and science. And there is an art and a science to managing the teams also. There is the process part of it, there is what you will learn in project management school about managing a product, and then there's the art part of it where you're dealing with human beings and interpersonal relationships and things that are a little bit more squishy. And both of those have to be balanced out when you are when you are trying culture of people that deliver on pride. All right. I'm really happy my voice made it to the end. So um, I will actually ask you to pause the camera for a minute. Yeah, there is, uh, when you think about managing teams, right, uh, it, it seems that there's come one point have been made that I think is very important. Um, don't think that it needs to be your destiny to progress to a point where you're managing the UX team. It's not for everybody. And one of the things that I was very lucky to be able to achieve at UITV is to create a different path. Um, one of the, I was talking about creating opportunities for growth laterally in terms of their skill set, it's just as important to create opportunities for people to progress. Right? Um, I was on a panel a little while ago talking about diversity um, and, and creating those opportunities. I think that's what I spoke about. I was in Cap uh, Canucks, right? Yep. The panel, yeah. So um, it's important to create those, those vertical as well as those lateral, lateral opportunities. But, Traditionally, and this is where I have to pick on the government. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> traditionally, when you're really good at what you do, they say, all right, um, you're really good at what you do, you're performing really well, I'm going to take you, I'm going to take you away from doing what you really love and what you're good at, I'm going to make you a people manager, because that's how you progress and that's how you climb the ladder. Right? And um, that person who was really good at what they were doing and really passionate about what not want to manage people. So they're faced with a very tough choice. Either I stay here and I don't get any more money and I don't get any more, um, I don't progress up the ladder, or I abandon everything I love and I start managing people, which I really hate. So to me, it was very important to be able to create paths for both of those types of people, where I do have a people manager role, but we're also creating kind of a subject matter expert allow somebody who's not managing projects and managing people to still progress up as a subject matter expert, still keep their hands dirty, but have all of the perks you would get out of people climbing that ladder. So that's kind of slightly
slightly outside of this subject matter, but it still relates to, to creating opportunities for people to grow uh, within an organization beyond just the management of the team. Um, sometimes you're just, your job is to just make us better technically, and that's okay too. All right, that's it. My voice has decided it's done. Thank you so much for your presentation. Howard? No